Well, this morning, I want to use Isaiah 40 to help us have a fresh look at who God is, to behold our God, as it says in verse 9. As we come around the Lord's table, we are all in need of God's comfort in the specific circumstances we're facing, whether it's the circumstances behind us, our past failures, regrets, sorrows, hurts for which we need God's healing. Might be the circumstances before us, which we know may be coming, an upcoming event that we're dreading or something that we're eagerly anticipating, or just that settled confidence we have that something is going to come, which we have no idea what it will be and is going to completely change our lives. Or it could be the circumstances within us, our private struggles, inadequacies, those weaknesses that only God and we know. God's encouragement to us today is that he brings comfort to us. That means he has compassion on us and comes to ease our plight through giving us a vision of himself. So in order for us to know his comfort, he calls us through the prophet Isaiah to behold your God, behold our God. In Isaiah 40, God is addressing the people of Judah, looking forward to the time when they're going to be in captivity in Babylon, a time when they're going to be tempted to think God's forgotten about us. He doesn't care about us. He's not powerful enough to help us or wise enough to get us out of this. And he's, as I said before, forgotten us. I'm just going to read, going to read the whole chapter because it's a beautiful passage. But it starts with comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured or directed the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? 
Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers before him, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The danger is not that when we face the circumstances of life, God will prove inadequate to our needs. The danger is that we will forget what he's actually like. The truth of who God is, it's not so easy to believe at times when the circumstances of life tend to cloud our vision of him. Whether it's in the midst of suffering on one extreme when our mind's almost too numb to grasp this reality, or on the other extreme when it's times of plenty and our hearts are satisfied with the things of this life and we're just complacent and we forget God. When we forget what God is like, we fail to fear him, to reverence and awe him as he is, is his right. And so when we're in this state, how can we expect to make good choices in life? Because we know from the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. You know, I'm preaching first to myself today um, because this has been my experience the past week. I had an extremely busy and stressful week with work where it seemed every waking thought between Sunday night and Friday night was, and most of my sleeping thoughts were about work. And I reached the end of Friday having not really thought about God for at least three days, um, feeling really spiritually barren, distant from him, um, because I hadn't made the time throughout the week to actually focus my gaze on him and see, to behold him. And as a result, what happens is the thoughts and the reactions become sinful because we aren't fearing him and walking step, I wasn't walking step by step in that. So I speak from not the experience of having done it, but um, God encouraged me yesterday meditating on this, that there is a way to have the victory in times of whatever situation we're going through. There is no circumstance that is too hard for him. Let's just pray briefly. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are and for this passage that opens our eyes, lifts our perspective to see you afresh. And I just pray that you would enable me, but that you would prepare all of our hearts to behold you this morning, that your name would be glorified and that we would behold you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What Isaiah tells us of God in this passage is nothing new, but he employs vivid imagery and pictures to break through the dullness of our hearts and lift our gaze to behold God. In verse, find it, verse 10, where he says, The Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. He's describing God coming as king and judge. We want to ask like David did in Psalm 24, who is this king of glory? How does, it, how does knowing him and seeing him relate to what he promises? Comfort, my people. 
How is he going to bring us comfort today? So firstly, I want to look at verse 11 to see God, the shepherd, our personal God. Because we can be tempted to think that God does not really care about the situation we're experiencing. We know he's out there, but we don't know the reality of him with us in the circumstance. And God shows us in this verse 11 that as our shepherd, he is a personal God to each one of us. And he meets our every need. It says he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Have a think about the verbs used to describe what God does as our shepherd. He will tend us. That means he will pasture us, take us to good pasture. He will gather us in his arms. He will carry us when we're too weak to go ourselves. And he'll gently lead us. What does this remind us of? Well, there was a shepherd once who said, The Lord is my shepherd. He, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you see that thought of comfort? David says that it is the shepherd's rod and staff that bring comfort. The rod was the shepherd's club. It used to fight off any creature that would try and harm the sheep. It, this emphasizes the shepherd's protection of the flock. The rod was the shepherd's crook, you know, that thing with the hook on the end. You go around and catch a sheep by the neck and pull it back in line. This is his directing of the flock. And in the same way, Isaiah in this verse describes how God as our shepherd comforts us by protecting us, carrying us in his arms, and by directing us, gently leading us to good pasture. However, as is the case with sheep we can choose to reject his comfort and go our own way a couple of weeks ago someone shared with me a message on this very psalm psalm 23 which i did share on our fellowship chat um but this message was by louis giglio and he addressed the very thought how is it possible for us to stay focused on the shepherd because it says he will prepare us a table to sit down with him but it says he'll do that in the middle of our enemies. I mean, what do we do about the fact that he's not going to take us out of the circumstance? He's right there in the middle of it. He'll prepare a table to dine with us. How do we hear his voice and block out the voices of the enemies around us? Well, someone once said, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice and he calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out of the sheep pen. When he is brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The key here is that the sheep hear the shepherd's voice. They know his voice and consequently they follow him. Whose voice? Who is the shepherd? Not long after this man said that, he also said in John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. That's right, Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth to live among us and reveal to us the fullness of God's shepherd heart for his people. We know that he cares for us in the specific situations we face because he laid down his life for us, his sheep. That's what we remember in a special way today at this time when we have our time of communion. We remember the shepherd who gave his body to be broken. He gave his blood to be shed in order that he might pay the penalty for our sins and bring us salvation. And that's why we follow our shepherd. We love him for giving his life for us, and we know that since he has demonstrated his love for us in this way, he will freely give us all things in Christ Jesus, as expressed in Romans 8, 32. But the second picture of God I want to take from this chapter is the vast majority of it, from verses 12 onwards, and... It is the picture of God as the Almighty, our powerful creator and sovereign ruler. The Almighty, it's a name used for God throughout the Old Testament, a lot in the book of Job, actually. And it's perhaps one which we should 
reacquaint ourselves with using, I think, because it says, it means what it says. God is almighty. Because the next temptation we can face when we're in the circumstances of life is to say, I know God is my shepherd. I know he cares for me and he wants to help me. But can he actually help me in this? I mean, this is something pretty serious going on here. Um, surely there's a limit to the capabilities of a shepherd. What if the sheep goes so far away and gets in such a dangerous position that the shepherd just says, oh, no, I can't do it, sorry. Well, using Isaiah's beautiful poetry, God responds with a series of emphatic rhetorical questions that completely devastate this argument by reminding us that he is far bigger than we can imagine. He's a powerful creator. God, Isaiah shows us God's omnipotence. He is all-powerful in a series of questions from verse 12. Just answer these in your mind. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? One person's estimate has that the total volume of water in the seas and lakes of the world is over 1 billion cubic kilometres. That's equivalent to one with 21 zeros, 1,000 billion billion one-litre bottles. And God's big enough to cup his hand and hold all that in his hand. Second question, who has marked off the heavens with a span? A span was a unit of measurement used in ancient time, and it's the distance between your pinky finger and your thumb. I measured mine this morning, it's about 22 centimetres. Um, I think the original thing was nine inches. God is big enough to go like that and have the whole universe sitting in between his thumb and his finger. Now, we don't even know how big the universe is, but scientists estimate that just for the Milky Way galaxy we're in, the distance from one end of the galaxy to the other is one with 18 zeros, that's one billion billion kilometres. So in comparison to my 22 centimetres, God's metaphorical hand is 100,000 billion billion, one with 23 zeros, centimetres long. And then lastly, Isaiah says, who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Do you realise that the earth is correctly proportioned and it rotates at just the right speed with just the right gravitational force keeping it around the sun so that it stays in its correct orbit and remains a suitable place for us to live on? Imagine if we were trying to create the earth and we're like, ah, oh, Himalayan mountains are sort of putting everything out of balance. So let's whack a mountain on the other side and uh, no, a bit, scrape a bit off that, make a Sahara desert. Um, gravity at seven, everyone's flying off the earth. Uh, maybe make it 10 metres squared per second on and everyone's being squashed. No, just perfectly designed this earth. It's all perfect. And he's the one who sustains it. Then if we skip down to verses 25 and 26, the Lord challenges his people, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and see who created these, the stars. He who brings out the host by number, he calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Again, I did a bit of research. One source I found estimated there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way and perhaps 10 trillion similar sized galaxies in the universe. So if we do the math, maths, we get one with 24 zeros after it, being the number of stars in the universe. Now that's just an estimate. And God says he knows the name of every one of them. It's by his power and his might that every one of them is in its place right now and stays in its place. Do we realize how big God is? But secondly, Isaiah, not only considers God as the powerful creator, but the sovereign ruler of the world. In verse 13 to 17, we're taken to the scene of a royal throne room where the king is governing a country and as he plans his next royal decree, could be increasing taxes or declaring war or knocking off his nearest family member who's a threat to the throne. He's receiving counsel from all his advisors and they share their opinions and recommend what he should do and 
Often their advice will influence his decision. He might change his mind based on what they say. So with this picture in your mind, answer me these questions. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Who showed him the way of understanding? That's right, God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. No one has had to teach him anything. He didn't have to go to school. There is nothing anyone can say to add to his perfect knowledge or wisdom. And as Isaiah concludes from these series of rhetorical questions, the answer to each one being no one, all the nations of earth with their schemes and their plans are like a drop from a big bucket of water. They're like a speck of dust on a set of scales. If you're cooking and you've just got a bit of flour left over in the scales and it doesn't show, that's what the amount of impact they have on God's decisions. He sits above the earth and he stretches out the heavens like we would go and stretch out some curtains. Before him, we're like grasshoppers are to us. In his sovereign will, he brings the rulers of this earth to nothing. They make their empires, but at a breath from God, they collapse. And for those who um, haven't seen stubble in, in a farming context, think of a dandelion flower in that example um, in the verse, verse 24 where Isaiah talks about God blowing on them and they wither. Think of a dandelion flower just blowing on it and off it disintegrates. That's the same picture. I don't have time now, but if you want a further perspective, a passage to lift your perspective and see this view of God, go to Job 38 and 39 and read that aloud because that's where God responds finally to Job's doubts and his questions and his strugglings throughout that whole book. And he responds with two chapters of rhetorical questions saying, can you do this? Can you create the stars? Can you make the thunder come, make the clouds happen, make, tell the wild goats where to find food? On and on he goes, just challenging Job. Think of who I am. You're, you're focusing so much on your circumstance. Lift your gaze to see who I am. So how does this view of God bring us comfort in our circumstances? Well, I propose that we receive God's comfort when we respond to who he is with a right worship of him in the midst of our situation. Isaiah presents this thought with two different challenges. Firstly, in verse 16 and 17, or 16 actually, he says that even if you burnt all the timber in the forests of Lebanon, which is known and was known in Bible times as well for being full of pine trees, I believe they are, and if you burnt every animal in that country on that wood for sacrifices, that wouldn't be worthy enough for our God. And then secondly, Isaiah exposes the foolishness of man's attempts to make idols, to try and make a likeness of God in verse 19 and 20. This should be a challenge to us, though. What or who am I worshipping if it's not God? It's good to be reminded of the standard Jesus set for his followers in Luke 9. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? And in Romans 12, we're told what is a good and acceptable worship of God. Because at the close of chapter 11, Paul actually quotes from this passage in Isaiah 40 to praise the almighty sovereignty and wisdom of God, saying, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has given to him a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. In the light of the awesome nature of God, Paul goes on to describe what is the only rational thing we can do to serve him as our response. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual and rational worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By leading us to worship God in his acceptable way, 
regardless of the situation we may be facing, actually in the middle of that situation, this vision of God as our almighty God brings us comfort in the middle of our circumstances because we know that his will is good and acceptable and perfect and we know that he's transforming us through this situation. Lastly, I just want to look at probably the best known passage from this chapter, the last verses from 27 to 31, where we consider God as being the everlasting God, our indwelling strength. Because another temptation we may face in the midst of life's circumstances is to say, you can tell me all you want that God cares for me. You can tell me all you want that he's all powerful and all knowing. That doesn't change the feeling I've got inside of me that I'm doomed. He doesn't know the full extent of the struggle I'm facing. And even if he does, I don't feel that he's able to help me or don't feel him helping me right now. Because deep down, I just know I don't have the strength to get through this situation. But I'm just going to give it my best shot. That's all I can do, isn't it? That's exactly what the people of Israel were saying in Isaiah 40, 27. They were saying, God's forgotten us. He doesn't see us. He's not just, he's not really considering our terrible situation. And in response, God gives us an amazing declaration of how he helps us in every situation. Have you not known? Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the world, of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. His, he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Consider the all-encompassing descriptions used here of God. He is everlasting. We are never going to outlive God. So we're never going to have to face a situation in life without him. He is the creator of the ends of the world, of the earth. We can never go anywhere in this universe that he didn't create and knows all about. He never gets tired. God will never leave us to face a situation alone because he's taking 40 winks up there. And his understanding is infinite. We will never face a circumstance that will leave God scratching his head wondering, how am I going to get him out of that? Our experience is that we will reach the limits of our own strength. That's sort of the attitude I did in that previous example of the temptation we can have and how we can think. And unfortunately, that was my unconscious attitude just this past week. I can't see myself getting through this, but I'm just going to give it my best shot. But God says we can't do it in our own strength. Even the fittest and strongest young men, it says, will fall exhausted, and I don't put myself in that category. But rather God promises that he will give power to the faint. He will increase strength for those who have no might. He promises to renew our strength, and that word has the thought of new grass sprouting again after rain. This is the comfort available to us as we behold God, our everlasting God. As Warren Wiersbe puts it, God enables us to soar when there is a crisis, to run when the challenges are many, and to walk faithfully in the day-by-day -day demands of life. It's much harder to walk in the ordinary pressures of life than to fly like the eagle in a time of crisis. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. The greatest heroes of the faith are not always those who seem to be soaring. Often it is they who are patiently plodding. As we wait on the Lord, he enables us not only to fly higher and to run faster, but also to walk longer. Blessed are the plodders, for they eventually arrive at their destination. And how does God comfort us in renewing our strength? Well, there's that thought it says in verse 31, those who wait for the Lord, wait on the Lord. It's an attitude of patient, persevering trust in God in the midst of the trials. And this is probably best 
expressed in 2 Corinthians 12 as Paul describes his struggle with a trial which continued. He, he called it the thorn in the flesh and God chose not to remove it from him even though he prayed three times that God would take it away from him. Instead, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul could say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's how God comforts us when we see him as the everlasting God. He, he gives us strength so we don't have to rely on our own strength because when we do, we will fail. So in summary, God brings us comfort for the circumstances of our lives by lifting our gaze to behold him as the shepherd, our personal God, who comforts us by directing us and protecting us as we listen to his voice and follow him. He brings us comfort as we see him as the almighty, our powerful creator and sovereign ruler, who comforts us by transforming our hearts and minds as we respond to his majesty in worship, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to him and living out his good and acceptable and perfect will. And lastly, he brings us comfort as we see him, the everlasting God, our indwelling strength, who comforts us by renewing our strength in his grace, giving us his power in place of our weakness. But as we come around the Lord's table now, there's one more picture I want to consider. And this one isn't in Isaiah 40, but let's turn 13 chapters forward to Isaiah 53. Because with these three pictures of the majesty of God in the forefront of our minds, how great he is, how big he is, how wise he is, how loving he is. Let's read how far he went how much he humbled himself and condescended and endured because of his love for you and me. Note how much of this chapter, so much of it is written from the perspective of seeing. We see him. It carries on that same thought from Isaiah 40. Behold your God. And that's what we want to do as we come around the table. I'm just going to read out... Um, different phrases from the verses in this chapter. We behold our God, we see him with no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. We see him despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We see him, one from whom men hide their faces. He was abhorrent. We see him despised, held in low esteem by us and by all people. We see him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. We see him pierced for our transgressions, hanging on that cross. We see him crushed for our iniquities. We see him bearing the punishment bearing our punishment, having wounds that bring us peace and healing. We see him bearing the iniquity of each one of us, us who are like disobedient sheep going our own way, and he bore the punishment for our sins. We see him silent in the face of oppression and affliction, whether it's the slapping of the soldiers, the mocking of the crowds, the mocking laughter of Herod and his soldiers or the unbelief of Pilate. Silent as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers. We see him crushed by God to make an offering for our sin. Under great anguish of soul, whether it's in the garden, saying, Lord, take this cup from me if it is your will. Or hanging there on the cross, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? How has God brought comfort to us through this vision of his son on the cross dying in our place? Well, in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, it says that God the Father 
shall see, look down and see his son dying there on that cross and be satisfied with the anguish of his soul. Because by his knowledge shall the righteous one, the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. As we behold him who is perfectly righteous, dying under the punishment for our sins, that we might be clothed with his righteousness to stand accepted in God's sight, we can only stand amazed at his love. And for those who put their trust in him, this final vision of God brings comfort in the knowledge that we are forgiven. We're made new. We're adopted into the family of God through Jesus' blood.